The Mysterious Disappearance of Louis Le Prince During the late 1880s, an innovative inventor named Louis Le Prince, originally from France, dedicated his efforts to the development of a revolutionary apparatus capable of capturing moving images on film. With his device, Le Prince embarked on a series of ambitious endeavours, filming numerous short movies in 1888 while residing in Leeds, England. Not long after, in the subsequent year, he introduced a groundbreaking invention to the world, celluloid film. This new technological advancement left audiences breathless, mesmerizing those who had never before witnessed the wonders of motion pictures, as they were called. During the year 1890, an event of great significance was about to take place in New York City, a public premiere showcasing the revolutionary motion picture camera designed by Le Prince. However, to everyone's surprise, Le Prince vanished under mysterious circumstances while on a journey in France, leaving behind an air of uncertainty regarding his contributions to the world of cinema. Despite these doubts, it is often attributed to William Kennedy Dixon, a talented individual who worked at the esteemed Edison Company's laboratories in New Jersey, that the honor of inventing the inaugural motion picture camera falls upon. Louis Amy Augustin Le Prince was welcomed into the world on August 28, 1841. His father served as a respectable officer in the renowned French army, instilling discipline and a sense of duty within young Le Prince from an early age. The path that Le Prince walked down was one that carried him through the doors of his father's comrade, the illustrious Louis-Jacques Monde Daguerre, who had garnered fame and reverence as a pioneer in the captivating world of photography. Le Prince embarked on a journey to the United States in 1881, where he assumed the role of an agent representing the business interests of his brother-in-law's esteemed company, Whitley Partners. After the completion of his contractual obligations with Whitley Partners, Le Prince chose to prolong his stay in the United States. During this period, he took charge of a talented group of French artists overseeing their creative endeavors. Together, they crafted expansive panoramas capturing historical battles of great significance. These meticulously crafted works of art found their way to exhibition halls across New York, captivating audiences with their grandeur and attention to detail. This marked the initiation of his venture into the realm of creating motion pictures. He embarked on the journey by developing a pioneering camera, which utilized a notable 16 lenses. This invention was the first patented creation by Le Prince, although he did not consider it an outright triumph. The unique characteristic of his invention was its ability to capture motion. However, it had a slight drawback in that each lens presented an image of the subject from a distinct viewpoint. Consequently, if these images were projected, the resulting display would exhibit a disorienting jumping effect in various directions. Le Prince made preparations for his upcoming journey to the United States in September 1890. His primary objective was to showcase the revolutionary capabilities of his motion picture camera through a public premiere in the vibrant city of New York. Accompanying him on this voyage were his beloved wife and children who had already arrived there. However, before embarking on this exciting adventure, Le Prince felt it was necessary to make a detour and pay a visit to his brother in the charming city of Dijon. This decision allowed Le Prince to spend quality time with his family as well as strengthen the bond with his brother before setting off on his groundbreaking mission in America. On the 16th of September, in the year 1890, while on his way to Paris, an unforeseen circumstance forced Le Prince to board a later train than originally intended. Unfortunately, this unexpected change in plans resulted in his friends and acquaintances in Paris being unaware of his delayed arrival. During this distressing time, his family was in a state of panic and extreme worry. Both the French police and Scotland Yard, renowned for their investigative prowess, dedicated themselves to an extensive and thorough search that lasted for several days. Despite their exhaustive efforts, Le Prince's whereabouts remained unknown. Numerous hypotheses have emerged regarding the demise of Le Prince. The Le Prince family held a strong suspicion that the untimely demise of their relative may have been directly linked to an ongoing patent dispute with the renowned inventor, Thomas Edison. This intriguing theory gained further attention through the publication of a book and the creation of a documentary called The Missing Reel in 1990. Notably, a prominent French film theorist named Jean Mitry 
went as far as to suggest that Le Prince's passing was not merely accidental, but rather a deliberate act of foul play. Mitri argued that if Le Prince truly desired to vanish without a trace, he had numerous opportunities to do so prior to embarking on his ill-fated journey. The public debut of Le Prince's motion picture camera invention, which was scheduled for 1890 in New York, unfortunately never came to pass. This unfortunate event has led to his significant contributions to the world of cinema often being overlooked or forgotten. The Mysterious Disappearance of Notorious Pirate Henry Every During his era, Henry Every reigned as the most renowned pirate, garnering unparalleled fame. If such a classification had existed in the 1690s, he would undeniably have held the infamous title of Public Enemy No. 1 squarely atop the most wanted list. No more than a generation after his capture of the Gang Isawai, spectators eagerly observed his daring exploits unfold on the theatrical stage in the production titled The Successful Pirate. Meanwhile, patrons of bustling alehouses would rhythmically thump their tankards and jugs upon tables, syncing their motions with the tunes of various ballads that chronicled Every's audacious escapades, occasionally gaining popularity for a week at a time. Fast forward to the year 1724, and an almost accurate depiction of Every's piratical exploits served as the captivating opening chapter in London's newly emerged best-selling literary work, A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, authored by the enigmatic Captain Charles Johnson. The recognition of Every's achievements extended beyond just the general public. Both the government and the influential East India Company were deeply concerned about capturing Every. The seizure of the Gang I Sawai, along with the subsequent reports of the brutalities that ensued, posed a significant threat to the already fragile relationship between the East India Company and Aurangzeb, the influential ruler of India. Without the support of Aurangzeb, the East India Company would have faced expulsion from the subcontinent, causing irreparable damage to the world's largest empire at its nascent stage. Every's remarkable accomplishments earned him the title of Arch Pirate, leading to the British government in Whitehall offering an unprecedented reward of £500 for his apprehension, a staggering sum for a pirate. The potential repercussions of Every's actions were not only recognised by the public, but also attracted attention from the highest echelons of power, further emphasising the significance of his capture. The extensive manhunt that ensued spanned across continents, making it undeniably the most monumental pursuit of the 17th century. In Britain, every law enforcement officer was on high alert, diligently searching for every and his crew. The pursuit extended to the colonies of North America and the Caribbean, where the pirates were relentlessly pursued. News of their whereabouts was eagerly sought after by ships visiting Madagascar, and even authorities in India and the Red Sea region, such as the Mughals authorities and the East India Company, actively participated in the search. The sheer scale and scope of this manhunt transcended geographical boundaries, showcasing the concerted efforts of law enforcement agencies across the globe. From the shores of Britain to the far reaches of the colonies, no stone was left unturned in the pursuit of these notorious pirates. Despite the considerable amount of effort invested, along with the enticing reward offered, the outcome was rather underwhelming. Only a small number of Every's cohorts were apprehended, and even then, the majority of them were eventually released. Every, the mastermind behind the operation, managed to vanish without a trace, taking with him his share of the stolen riches and evading capture indefinitely. During the golden age of piracy from approximately 1690 to 1730, numerous notorious pirates met their fates in various ways. There were also those who suffered the grim destiny of being marooned on desolate islands or falling victim to mutinous crews. However, in the midst of this dangerous era, one pirate stands out for his remarkable achievement, Henry Every. Unlike his contemporaries, Henry Every not only survived, but he thrived. While only a handful of pirate captains managed to accept a pardon or retire to tropical paradises, none reached the level of success that Henry Every did. The enigmatic destiny of Henry Every continues to baffle historians and researchers, as his whereabouts and the fate of his vast fortunes remain shrouded in mystery, never to be uncovered. However, the ripple effects of his actions carried on for decades, permeating through the pages of history and leaving an indelible mark on the world. 
The void left by his disappearance sparked a revolution of sorts, igniting a flame within a subsequent generation of pirates who sought to emulate his audacity and daring exploits. The USS Cyclops Mystery The USS Cyclops remains an enduring enigma within the naval community, as it vanished without a trace a century ago during its journey from the Caribbean to Baltimore. This perplexing disappearance has become one of the most captivating mysteries in the history of the naval service. In March 1918, a colossal search operation was launched in a desperate attempt to locate a majestic coal hauler vessel measuring an impressive 540 feet in length. Regrettably, despite exhaustive efforts, this mighty ship, referred to as a collier, along with its esteemed crew of 309 individuals, tragically disappeared without a trace in the vast depths of the sea. The incident would eventually be remembered as the most devastating non-combat tragedy in the history of the Navy, marking a significant loss of life. The Cyclops, an enormous steel-hulled vessel, was constructed in Philadelphia and served as the Navy's largest and swiftest fuel ship. Boasting impressive dimensions of approximately 540 feet in length and 65 feet in width, this maritime behemoth had the capacity to transport a staggering 12,500 tons of coal while propelling through the water at a swift speed of 15 knots. Equipped with robust winches, the Cyclops could effortlessly hoist and transport 800-pound bags of anthracite through a network of sturdy cables. The ship, which set sail in May 1910, was specifically built to provide fuel for the Navy fleet. This task was not only demanding, but also carried significant risks. The presence of coal in the cargo hold posed a constant threat of combustion, adding to the already perilous nature of the work. The group of sailors departed from Norfolk and embarked on a voyage along the Atlantic coast, making their way towards various United States military installations located in Cuba, Haiti, and Puerto Rico. During the outbreak of World War I in April 1917, the Cyclops, a naval vessel equipped with powerful 50 caliber guns, played a crucial role in transporting doctors and essential medical supplies from Johns Hopkins Hospital in the United States to Saint-Nazaire, France. Months elapsed before the ship finally reached the shores of Brazil, where it eagerly awaited its cargo of 10,000 tons of manganese ore. This particular type of ore was unlike anything the crew had encountered before. It was significantly denser and heavier than coal. Familiarizing themselves with the handling and logistics of this new cargo became a priority. Once the ship was loaded to its maximum capacity with the valuable ore, it embarked on a journey towards Barbados. This pit stop lasted for a span of nine days allowing the crew to resupply and tend to any necessary maintenance and repairs. The search for the missing ship was methodical and thorough. Navy cruisers diligently combed through the trade routes, meticulously explored the beaches, and meticulously inspected remote bays. The dedicated crews tirelessly transmitted radio signals in hopes of establishing contact with the lost vessel. But each passing day brought disappointment as there was no response, no sign of wreckage, not even a trace of an oil slick. It was as if the ship had mysteriously disappeared without a trace. In June of 1918, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was serving as the Assistant Navy Secretary at the time, made a solemn announcement regarding the fate of a ship and its crew of 309 men. Tragically, they were deemed lost at sea, resulting in an immense loss of life that remains unparalleled in the annals of U.S. naval history. Navy Secretary Josephus Daniels expressed his astonishment at the perplexing enigma that remains elusive within the maritime history of the Navy, the mysterious vanishing of the USS Cyclops in March. An extensive and tireless exploration of the entire vicinity bore no fruit, as not a single trace of the vessel could be found, leaving investigators perplexed and disheartened. This inexplicable disappearance, which has defied all attempts at resolution, has left the Navy and maritime community bewildered. There were numerous speculations surrounding the mysterious sinking of the ship. One theory suggested that the heavy ore cargo might have caused the hull to rupture, leading to an instant sinking. Another possibility was that the unfamiliar cargo had leaked fumes, resulting in the poisoning of the crew. While it was also speculated that U-boat torpedoes could have been responsible for the ship's demise, the absence of debris raised doubts about this theory. The absence of any distress calls and the lack of a storm further questioned the hypothesis that rough seas had swamped the ship. 
Additionally, some believed that German raiders could have captured the ship, holding the crew hostage and making their way back home with their valuable prize. However, this theory was deemed unlikely due to the Cyclops' insufficient fuel for a transatlantic voyage. The circumstances surrounding the sinking of the ship remained shrouded in mystery. Despite the distressing circumstances, the families of the Baltimore sailors were left without any resolutions. These seamen, including individuals such as Charles Holmes, who had a wife and a young son residing on Presbury Street, and Edward Dresbach, who regularly sent cheerful letters to his mother living on Harlem Avenue, faced an uncertain fate. Additionally, the tragic plight extended to Beverly Jones and Herbert Price, two teenagers hailing from the city, aged merely 17 years old. In the present day, the memory of those individuals is only preserved through a few sparse reminders. The Mystery of Oak Island Nova Scotia, situated on the northeastern tip of the United States, is characterized by its chilly climate, damp ambience, and tranquil atmosphere. However, what continues to captivate people's imaginations and lure them back to this region is the enduring enigma of buried treasure. This mysterious phenomenon has fascinated generations with its allure and intrigue. Nova Scotia, with its unforgiving weather and serene aura, has become synonymous with unsolved secrets and hidden riches. Located along the southeast coast of Nova Scotia, there exists a small island among the vast expanse of over 300 similar islands. This particular island holds a significant place in history as the legendary Oak Island Money Pit resides here. Theories suggest that Europeans may have set foot on this island as early as the 12th century, but it wasn't until the 18th century that the French or Canadian fishermen became its initial inhabitants. The tale of hidden riches began to circulate in the 1790s when a curious 16-year-old boy, Daniel McGuinness, made a remarkable discovery while fishing around the island. Straying from the heavily forested areas that the island was known for, he stumbled upon a mysteriously barren clearing slightly sunken into the ground. This peculiar find ignited the boy's imagination. According to local legends, the island was believed to be the secret burial site of the treasure amassed by Scottish sailor Captain William Kidd nearly a century earlier. It was whispered that the value of this fabled bounty was in the millions of dollars. This account, along with the captivating clearing McGuinness had encountered, convinced him that the legends held some truth. Eager to unveil the truth, McGuinness enlisted the help of two friends and made their way to the eastern side of the island, where the peculiar clearing lay. With shovels in hand, they embarked on their excavation adventure, driven by the possibility of unearthing the long-lost riches. The comprehensive exploration of Oak Island offers a fascinating glimpse into history, from its earliest inhabitants to the enduring tales of hidden treasures. By delving into the depths of this mystifying island, we can enrich our understanding of the past and perhaps unlock the secrets that lie beneath the surface. During their excavation on Oak Island, the boys encountered a fascinating phenomenon. Peculiar, horizontal logs resembling platforms, which appeared at regular intervals as they dug deeper. Armed only with shovels, they soon recognized the need for more advanced machinery to continue their ambitious endeavor. Determined to lay claim to the hidden treasure, the trio forged a pact, promising to return to this mysterious location. Almost a decade later, their long-awaited opportunity arrived, facilitated by the financial support of the esteemed businessman Simeon Linz and the backing of the Onslow Company. Upon their return, they discovered that the site remained exactly as they had left it, a testament to the enigmatic allure of Oak Island. Undeterred, the men resumed their excavation, unearthing not only additional oak tree platforms, but also bewildering discoveries that defied explanation. Among these puzzling artifacts were a sticky, putty-like substance and coconut husks, leaving the excavators perplexed. As their dig progressed, the water level within the hole gradually began to rise, posing further challenges to their pursuit. However, their tenacity paid off when, Reaching a depth of approximately 90 feet, the crew made an astonishing claim of unearthing a stone bearing an intricate code. Although the true meaning remained elusive for many years, subsequent translations revealed its cryptic message. Forty feet below, two million pounds are buried. Unfortunately, the passage of time has seen the stone vanish, 
leaving behind only second-hand narratives as testament to its existence. After making this remarkable discovery, the crew became confident that the long-sought-after treasure lay right beneath the spot where the stone was found. However, to their disappointment, their efforts to uncover the treasure were met with the sight of more oak platforms upon removing the stone. As night descended, the crew decided to temporarily halt their work. It is said that the next day happened to be a Sunday, and in accordance with their religious beliefs, they refrained from working. Resuming their excavation on the subsequent Monday, they were startled to find that the pit had become inundated with water. Unfortunately, due to the limited excavation technology available during that time, the crew had no choice but to abandon their quest, leaving the tantalizing possibility of the treasure for future adventurers to pursue. Subsequent accounts reveal that the trio of men did indeed succeed in discovering the elusive treasure, contradicting their initial claim of returning empty-handed. However, the veracity of these allegations was never verified or substantiated. This was just the first of many more expeditions to come in search of the fabled buried treasure. Later, in the 1860s, a new company called the Oak Island Association set out to solve the mystery. They dug a separate passage next to the treasure pit in an attempt to drain it. This plan ended up backfiring when the new hole caved in, and many of the men nearly lost their lives. The last recorded expedition during the 19th century began in 1896 and lasted roughly two years. The unnamed group attempted to excavate the site, equipped with steam-powered water pumps and more advanced boring machinery. Their attempts to drain the water proved unsuccessful, despite their modern technology. They believed the pit must have led to other exits somewhere around the island, and this theory was proved correct when they poured red paint into the pit, revealing three other holes where the water could enter and exit. Several years later, in 1909, an expedition led by the Old Gold Salvage Group traveled to Oak Island. The team was led by Captain Henry Bowden, and a notable member of the crew was a young Franklin Roosevelt, who would eventually go on to be the 32nd President of the United States. The expedition that took place on Oak Island involved excavating the reputed treasure site to a depth of just over 100 feet. Instead of opting to drain the water that impeded their progress, the team decided to send divers down, hoping for a breakthrough discovery. Unfortunately, their efforts did not yield any significant findings. Despite this lack of success, the mystery of Oak Island continued to captivate the imagination of many, including Franklin Roosevelt, who remained well informed about the ongoing investigations. This, in turn, contributed to the enduring allure and popularity of the legend as time went on. It wasn't until two decades later, following the failed old gold salvage excavation, that any recorded attempts to uncover the elusive treasure re-emerged. In 1928, William Chapel took it upon himself to delve into the enigma. He strategically collapsed a shaft near the presumed location of the original money pit. While no concrete evidence was documented, rumors circulated that Chapel had stumbled upon an anchor, an axe, and even a Celtic miner's pickaxe during his exploration. Around the same period, an American industrialist named Gilbert Hedden became intrigued by the Oak Island mystery, particularly in terms of the complex structural challenges involved in retrieving the fabled riches. As an engineer and manager of a steel fabrication company, Hedden believed he possessed the necessary knowledge and resources to solve the puzzle once and for all. After the conclusion of William Chapel's expedition, Hedden embarked on numerous journeys to Oak Island in the subsequent years, displaying a deep commitment to unraveling its mysteries. In fact, he went a step further by acquiring the majority of land located in the southern section of the island. Despite investing an immense amount of effort, the pursuit of treasure yielded no fruitful results. Undeterred by the lack of success, numerous endeavors persisted well into the 21st century, dedicated to unearthing the long-awaited riches. Notably, one intrepid explorer by the name of Robert Dunfield even employed the use of an enormous digging crane and various other machinery to assist in his pursuit. This arduous undertaking resulted in the construction of a causeway in 1965, which remains intact to this day, serving as a visible reminder of the island's ongoing allure. In the year 2006, brothers Marty and Rick Legina from Michigan embarked on a remarkable venture, 
by purchasing a 50% stake in the ownership of an island, driven by their unwavering desire to uncover a hidden treasure that had long piqued their curiosity. Their ardent pursuit led them to gain the rights for excavation in 2010, with the condition that their activities should not detrimentally impact the thriving tourism industry associated with the island. In the year 2014, an immensely popular television program called The Curse of Oak Island made its debut on the Discovery Channel. Despite the title being somewhat misleading, this series brought the ancient legend of Oak Island to the pinnacle of its fame and intrigue. The show's cast member, Gary Drayton, gained significant attention for his supposed discoveries, which included an intriguing iron cross that is speculated to have belonged to the enigmatic Knights Templar. Additionally, he allegedly stumbled upon two centuries-old brooches that are thought to have possibly been once owned by the iconic Marie Antoinette herself. However, the most captivating find to date occurred in 2018, when Drayton purportedly uncovered a diminutive fragment of pure gold. While certain skeptics view these discoveries as manufactured for the sole purpose of boosting television ratings, there is no concrete evidence to support or refute these claims, leaving their authenticity still unconfirmed. Oak Island boasts a fascinating and extensive history of treasure hunting, yet there exists a faction of theorists who doubt the existence of any hidden riches. Back in the 18th century, Daniel McGuinness stumbled upon a sunken plot of land believed to have been filled with earth. However, skeptics argue that this pit may have formed naturally through interconnected sinkholes, subterranean caverns, and passageways scattered throughout the island, pointing to the release of red paint during the 1896 excavations as supporting evidence. Despite the skepticism expressed by some, the majority of believers harbor alternative explanations. Before the pit's discovery, the earliest hypothesis regarding Oak Island's secrets harks back to the captivating legend of Captain William Kidd. According to folklore, the Scottish mariner illicitly collaborated with the renowned pirate Henry Avery, with the duo supposedly stashing their illicitly gained wealth on Oak Island. Furthermore, other pirate-centered theories suggest the involvement of Captain William Blackbeard Teach. Another intriguing theory posits that the pit was created by Spanish explorer sailors who, after weathering a ravaging storm that left their vessel severely damaged, sought a secluded location in which to hastily conceal their ill-gotten treasures, harboring the hope of a future return. Truly, the allure of Oak Island's enigma continues to captivate and fascinate treasure seekers and enthusiasts alike, prompting further investigation into the island's hidden depths. Through a comprehensive exploration of historical records and modern technologies, researchers and adventurers strive to unravel the mysteries shrouding Oak Island's fabled treasure, delving into the captivating narratives that interweave tales of pirates, treasure hunters, and hidden riches from centuries past. It has been suggested by some individuals that the valuable treasure, which could potentially be valued at an astounding $180 million, was hidden and eventually abandoned by British troops during the British invasion of Cuba in 1762. Another captivating tale revolves around the events of 1789, when a women's march on the Palace of Versailles took place, with Queen Marie Antoinette present. According to this popular legend, the Queen, in a moment of urgency, instructed her trusted maid to hastily gather her most precious jewellery and valuable artwork and promptly depart. Allegedly, the maid fled to Nova Scotia and covertly concealed the Queen's possessions within the depths of the infamous Oak Island pit. This intriguing narrative gained some validation in 2017 when two brooches were discovered during an episode of the widely watched television show The Curse of Oak Island. These brooches were astonishingly dated to be around 500 years old, further fueling speculation. However, it is important to note that the authenticity of this legend and the connection to the Queen's possessions remain unconfirmed. The possibility of a hidden treasure left behind by British troops in 1762 coupled with the enigmatic tale of Queen Marie Antoinette's maid and the mysterious Oak Island pit, continue to captivate the imagination of treasure hunters and history enthusiasts alike. Its immense potential value and the historical intrigue surrounding it make this elusive treasure a subject of fascination and speculation. According to an alternative theory supported by some evidence, the presence of the Iron Cross, which was also discovered on the television show, is believed to be connected to the enigmatic Knights Templar. 
Legends suggest that exiled members of the Knights Templar sought refuge on Oak Island, with speculation that the Money Pit could potentially serve as the final resting place of significant relics such as the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail, along with various other treasures. Additionally, there are those who speculate that the pit may hold valuable Shakespearean manuscripts authored by Sir Roger Bacon, fueling the long-standing debate around Bacon's alleged role as the true writer behind Shakespeare's works. This intricate legend is deeply intertwined with the belief that Bacon's influence extends beyond his established contributions, forming a compelling narrative in its own right. The Oak Island mystery has captivated countless individuals for centuries, and the local residents of the island simply desire to be left undisturbed. This intriguing legend has inspired numerous literary works, captivating television shows, gripping documentary films, and even engaging podcast series. Unless substantial evidence or treasure is unearthed, or until the entire island is meticulously excavated, the relentless pursuit of truth and discovery will inevitably persist. The enigmatic Oak Island mystery transcends time, continuing to perplex and fascinate those who dare to explore its depths. Jeannie Wiley, the Feral Child Susan Wiley, better known by her pseudonym Jeannie, is an American child who was a victim of abuse so severe that she has been labelled a feral child. Her name is commonly spoken in academic circles, with her traumatising life often being reduced to a case study amongst psychologists and linguists. The horrors faced by Jeannie in her childhood haunted her and will continue to do so for the rest of her life. The hardship in Jeannie's life began before her father's neglect. She experienced medical complications from birth, making her late to walk, amongst other abnormalities, prompting her father to question her mental development. Though by 11 months, Jeannie had relatively typical development, in good health with no indicators of mental delays. Her mum offered questionable accounts regarding her childhood, suggesting Jeannie did not care for physical affection, did not babble as a baby, and resisted solid food. Sometimes her mother recalled contradictory facts, saying that Jeannie had spoken single words and then later commenting that she never spoke at all. By 14 months old, Jeannie became ill, suffering with pneumonitis. At this time, the paediatrician opened the discussion into the possibility of brain dysfunction. When Jeannie was 20 months old, her father's mother's life was taken in a hit and run. The probationary sentence given to the truck driver angered Jeannie's father, pushing him into a delusional rage. He relocated the family into his deceased mother's home, isolating them and hiding Jeannie. From just 20 months old, Jeannie's life of trauma and isolation began. Her dad kept her locked in a room, strapped to a child's toilet by the arms and legs for 13 hours per day, then tied into a sleeping bag in the crib at night. She was bound into a harness her mother had made which acted like a straitjacket, drastically limiting her movement. Should Jeannie make a noise, her father would hit her with a plank, growl at her or scratch her. Jeannie quickly learned to live in silence. Her parents and brother would sleep in the living room, where her father lay with a shotgun, ready should one of them aim to help Jeannie. Their father barely allowed them to speak to one another, never mind the daughter he was treating so horrifically. As a result, Jeannie never learned to speak. Jeannie's life was confined to the dark, small room. No visitors entered the house and her father had cut the family off from most friends and extended family. Jeannie's mother, who was nearly entirely blind, was beaten and threatened when she attempted to contact friends, her parents or the police. Meanwhile, neighbours were entirely unaware that Jeannie existed. Change came when Jeannie was 13. Jeannie's mother tried to seek disability benefits to aid her with her deteriorating eyesight, though entered a social services office by mistake, with Jeannie in tow. The social worker, upon seeing Jeannie, could see something was not right, and was mortified upon hearing she was 13, having guessed she was 6. The police arrived and Jeannie became a ward of the court. She was taken to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. It did not take long for people to realize the extent of Jeannie's suffering. Jeannie stood at 4 foot 6 inches tall and weighed just 59 pounds. Her list of medical issues was extensive. Her physical development was poor and her mental age was compared to that of a 13-month-old. 
Aspects of her health, such as her vision, appeared okay at first, though it was later revealed that she was unable to focus her eyes further than the dimensions of the room she had lived in. Jeannie became key to the press, to linguists and psychologists. Now, the whereabouts of Jeannie is unknown to the masses to prevent more harm from coming to the innocent girl who was thrown from the hands of her abuser into the world of academic observation. Many people recognize the photo of Jeannie, Susan Wiley, that was released from the press in 1970. The Discovery and Alleged Curse of King Tutankhamun Many of us remember studying the pharaohs at school, though while we were learning about the pyramids, we were not necessarily told about the curse of the pharaohs. For centuries, whispers have spread of a curse being placed upon anyone who disturbs an ancient Egyptian mummy, particularly that of a pharaoh. The curse will not look more favorably upon archaeologists than thieves, and many believe these curses will spread ill luck, disease, and even fatalities. People have searched for more scientific explanations whenever mysterious events have occurred following the moving of tombs, suggesting causes such as bacteria or radiation causing harm. Though there are plenty of people out there who investigate the culture and believe these causes are a cultural magic, not a matter of science. One tomb has come up more often than others when discussing curses, however, and that is Tutankhamun's. Howard Carter and his team opened the tomb in 1923, acting as a catalyst to modern research into Egyptology. It did not take long for the coincidences, or rather the effects of the curse, to begin piling up. James Henry Breasted worked with Carter shortly following the opening of the tomb. Breasted recalls Carter sending a messenger to his house on an errand, when the messenger reported hearing what was described as a faint, almost human cry. He turned to see a cobra in the birdcage and, as any Egyptologist would know, the cobra represents the Egyptian monarchy. Carter's canary had lost its life within the mouth of the cobra. Could it have been symbolic of the Egyptian monarchy? The next victim of the alleged curse was Lord Carnarvon, the man who funded the excavation of the pharaoh's tomb. The lord was bitten by a mosquito and caught the bite whilst shaving. The wound became infected and he lost his life. The cause was blood poisoning. The autopsy of Tutankhamun revealed a healed lesion in his left cheek, and some suggested the location of Lord Carnarvon's wound may have aligned, though his burial six months prior made this difficult to confirm. Others theorized the Lord had come into contact with toxic fungi and his loss of life was simply oddly timed but was nothing to do with the disturbance of the pharaoh's tomb. A friend of Carter's, Bruce Ingram, received a paperweight made from a mummified hand with a scarab bracelet. Not long after receiving this gift, Ingram's house burned down and was then flooded after being rebuilt. Despite this series of events, Carter, among others, remained skeptical of the curse. After all, many others who visited the tomb lived long, happy lives. Though Carter did report in his diary sightings of a jackal, much like Anubis, the guardian of the afterlife. Could these curses be entirely that? Is there a scientific explanation, or are these tragedies merely coincidental? Some stories will live in the minds of many for years, and in many instances we will be reminded of these tragic events from simply a photograph. The Hilo Tsunami of 1946 In the middle of the night of April 1st, 1946, an earthquake occurred underwater off the coast of Alaska, about 13,000 feet beneath sea level. This quake measured at 7.4 magnitude and caused massive tidal waves to sweep across the Pacific Ocean. The nearest landmass was Unimac Island, the largest of the Aleutian Island chain in Alaska. It was hit by the tsunami not long after the earthquake stopped. It is estimated that a massive wave measuring nearly 100 feet smashed onto shore, decimating everything in its path. There was a small lighthouse situated about 30 feet above sea level with five people living in it at the time. The lighthouse was destroyed and all five people lost their lives. 
the enormous wave continued along its path towards Hawaii in the South Pacific, traveling at speeds upwards of 500 miles per hour. It sped across 2,400 miles, reaching the islands four and a half hours after the initial earthquake in Alaska. The first person to spot the tsunami was a captain of the United States Navy, Captain Wickland. He was positioned on the bridge of his ship at about 46 feet above sea level when he spotted what he described as a monster wave two miles long. He put in the warning call at 7 a.m., but it was not early enough for a successful evacuation. The tsunami steered towards Hilo Bay on the island of Hawaii, which is nicknamed the tsunami capital of the United States. Due to its topography, the bay constantly leads tsunamis from earthquakes in Chile and the Aleutian Islands. As the first tidal waves began appearing on the island, water in the bay receded, leaving boats and fish alike stranded on the sea floor. This drawback is a natural warning that a tsunami is approaching, but can only give you a few minutes head start at best before the tsunami hits. In Hilo Bay, the tidal wave reached 32 feet high when it struck and completely decimated about a third of the city. It even managed to pick up the bridge crossing at the Wailuku River and push it back 300 feet. The tsunami reached 60 feet on the other island areas, such as in Laupahoho, where a schoolhouse was destroyed and 25 students and a teacher were lost. In Hilo alone, the tsunami wiped out 96 people. The wave even traveled as far as Chile, about 18 hours after the initial earthquake, although it only materialized as abnormally large waves and caused no casualties. Due to the severity of the tsunami and the destruction it brought, the US government decided to establish an early warning system in the event of future earthquakes. The Seismic Sea Wave Warning System, now known as the Pacific Tsunami Warning System, was set up two years after the Hilo Bay devastation. This system uses underwater buoys located throughout the Pacific Ocean to monitor earthquakes and potential killer wave activity. It was first utilized in 1952 and successfully evacuated residents, although fortunately the tsunami never occurred. Some people might have initially believed or wanted to believe that the Hilo Bay tsunami was an April Fool's joke. Still, this massive tsunami ended up being one of the worst to hit the Hawaiian coast. The photographs taken by the residents and survivors show just how terrifying it must have been to live through. Billy the Kid may have lived on. Of all the Wild West names, Billy the Kid brings most recognition as even those who know little of this era seem to know something about him. Born William Bonney, but known as both Henry McCarty and Billy the Kid, Bonnie was said to have been mercilessly shot at the age of 21 by Pat Garrett, the sheriff of Fort Sumner, New Mexico, in 1881. Sources from this time tell us that he was supposedly buried in the Fort Sumner Cemetery alongside Tomo Folliard and Charlie Beaudry, his comrades in crime. The story has been fantasized endlessly on paper, in television and film, and all other forms of media since. The tale of Billy the Kid is one of the greatest stories to have been born out of the Wild West. Billy the Kid was an infamous outlaw, possibly one of the most dangerous criminals of his time despite his youth, and is painted either as a hero of the underdog, standing up against the cruelty of corrupt policemen, or as a ruthless badman of officers of the law. The truth to whether he actually lost his life in 1881 has never properly been confirmed, and more so assumed. William V. Morrison, was a paralegal in the 1940s who became intrigued by a man named Joe Hines, a survivor of the conflict of Lincoln County, which begun Billy's legacy. Hines proceeded to claim that Billy never lost his life and lived in Texas under the alias of Ollie Roberts. Morrison tracked Roberts down and when questioned about his identity, he confessed to being Billy himself. By this point, he would have been over 90 years old. Roberts wanted Morrison's assistance in gaining the pardon promised to Billy the Kid in 1879 by the New Mexican governor, Lou Wallace. And though Morrison tried to file a petition for Roberts' case, the elderly man passed away the following month. Ever since this occurrence, people have conflicted about the claim and whether it is even true. This controversy has flared up time and time again. The Wild West was an unprecedented time of intrigue, crime, liberation and fear.
It is no wonder that so many people are infatuated with learning about all the things that went on during this lawless time in America. Many secrets remain hidden. Will the truth ever come to light? Could there be secrets out there lurking that would shatter our very perception of what the Wild West was really like? Deceased outlaw William Brazen Bill Brazelton wearing a mask, 1878. On the 19th of August in 1878, a man was put to rest in the Evergreen Memorial Park in Arizona, USA. This man was set to become a thing of legend. William Whitney Brazelton, known colloquially as Brazen Bill, who led a life of debauchery as well as taking the lives of others. Many of his crimes came to light after his life ended, with one account claiming that he had taken the life of his first man in ice-cold blood at the tender age of 15. Another person declared that Brazen Bill lived inside of a boiler, and more people were still adamant that he once eliminated an entire posse of seven men in New Mexico. These tall tales of Brazelton's life were repeated and solidified in public awareness at the start of the 20th century by John Clum. The problem being that he offered absolutely no sources for such claims and over-exaggeration must be considered when discussing Brazelton. In 1876, Brazen Bill allegedly resided in Arizona where he was said to have eaten an entire wheel from a wagon during a trope show. What Brazelton was truly infamous for, however, was the plethora of robberies he committed. During his highway robberies, he would put a mask over his head and hold a firearm in each hand threatening passengers and drivers to give up their possessions and valuables to him. According to the sources that do exist, he committed nine alleged robberies in both New Mexico and Arizona, but it is possible that he committed countless more. Among the nine known robberies, on July 31, 1878, Brazelton robbed the stagecoach John Clum was on. This was Clum's first personal meeting with the Wild West criminal, and is what spurred Clum who was a newspaper editor to fixate on him and spread the word of his crimes and kept the flame on his legend alive. Not all of Brazelton's robberies resulted in much financial gain, but the ones that did were fruitful. He is thought to have accumulated an estimated total of $3,000 or more throughout his career, which is equivalent to around $82,000 in today's economy. As with all good times, Brazelton's criminal career had to eventually come to an end, and end it did. After he stole a horse from a man named David Nemitz, the horse was found and traced back to the owner, who then agreed to assist authorities in finding Brazelton in exchange for protection from him. Charles A. Chabelle, the sheriff for the Pima County, led a five-man posse to track down and shoot the infamous Batman. He was found with two cartridge belts, three firearms, earrings from a robbery he committed at Point Mountain, a gold watch, and a chain. We can only imagine the terror experienced by innocent train passengers when they saw him, firearms in hand and that horrifying mask over his face, threatening to take their lives if they did not give him everything they had. Geraldine Largay Many people love to hike. It is a popular yet dangerous hobby as was proved by the case of Geraldine Lage. Geraldine had completed many hiking trails back at home, but this one proved to be a little different. Geraldine, or Jerry, went missing whilst hiking in the Appalachian Trail back in 2013, and when she was found two years later, her journal entries were uncovered too, which suggested she suffered for 26 days after getting lost. Lage was a keen hiker and was prepared for her hike of the Appalachian Trail. She embarked upon a through hike, making her way along the 2,168 miles while her husband met her periodically to pass on some supplies and encouragement. On the day she went missing, her husband, George, had driven to the Route 27 crossing 22 miles away from the shelter his wife was last seen at. The only clue that could help the police in their search for the missing hiker was a photograph that had been taken on the morning she disappeared. After having found Jerry, a series of heart-wrenching texts were found, beginning with one she tried to send at 11am that day saying, In some trouble. Got off trail to go BR, now lost. Can you call AMC to see if a trail maintainer can help me, somewhere north of Woods Road? 
Though the lack of service meant her cry for help was never received, over the course of 90 minutes, she attempted to resend her plea 10 times. Another message failed to send which read, Lost since yesterday, off trail 3 or 4 miles, call police for what to do please. Jerry tried to send this at 4.18pm. By now her husband grew frightened and an official search was underway. From aircraft to park rangers to fire departments, the search was not short of men and was thorough, but not quite thorough enough. In 2015, a forester uncovered what was a potential body of Jerry at a campsite. The forester commented, I saw a flattened tent with a green backpack outside of it and a human skull with what I believed to be a sleeping bag around it. I was 99% certain that this was Jerry Larges. Her notebook was found with diary entries dated until August 18th, though the accuracy of this date has been questioned. It was entitled, George, please read, and she was found with a note begging, when you find my body, please call my husband, George, and my daughter, Kerry. Her message continued, ending with, please find it in your heart to mail the contents of this bag to one of them. The acceptance of death in such a terrifying situation is tragic and daunting to say the least, and many hikers will remember seeing the photo of Geraldine Lage along the Appalachian Trail, a haunting reminder as to how dangerous hiking truly can be. Leatherman the Vagabond With a scary name like Leatherman, you would be forgiven for thinking this character was taken out of a horror film. But the photo of this disheveled man actually shows one of the most unique vagabonds in American history. The Leatherman, as locals called him, was a homeless man that walked stretches between the Connecticut River and Hudson River in the northeastern United States. The man, whose name can't be confirmed, became something of a local celebrity due to his cyclical route around the same small towns during the course of the years. Every year, the Leatherman walked 365 miles and would return to each town roughly every 34 days. The regularity of his walk meant that locals began to recognize him and gave him his nickname on account of his handmade leather hat, scarf, and clothes, as well as his dirty appearance. People liked Leatherman so much that 10 towns even made him exempt from the 1879 Tramp Law, which put restrictions on those who did not own a home or have a job. The Leatherman wandered the New England region and stayed in shelters made by rocks and small cliff sides. These small hovels are known as Leatherman Caves today in the local area. Roughly every five weeks, the Leatherman would stop off at towns to stock up on food and supplies. That said, the Leatherman was unable to speak English, but was fluent in French, leading people to believe he was of Canadian origin. Some today even suggest he came from Picardy, France. While Leatherman was fluent in French, he was not known to speak any more than what was necessary, with heavy use of gesturing as well as grunting. He would very rarely use his broken understanding of English and was known to quickly close up when asked about his family. Amazingly, the Leatherman was able to survive for many years despite the harsh weather of the region, especially in the winter months. It's said that he was able to avoid the cold by creating fires in his small rock shelters, and he had not suffered from any lost fingers due to frostbite, despite most other vagabonds suffering severely. In 1888, the Connecticut Humane Society had him arrested and hospitalized against his will. Under hospital care, Leatherman was diagnosed as sane except for an emotional affliction. Since he didn't want to stay in care and had money, he was eventually released. Eventually, Leatherman passed away on the 24th of March, 1889, in his Saw Mill Woods Cave on the farm of George Dell near the town of Mount Pleasant, New York. He had passed away from cancer of the mouth, caused by years of chewing tobacco on his long, winding walks. Chief John Smith, the man who lived to 137 The lifespan of humans is something that has changed drastically throughout time. In the United Kingdom today, the average life expectancy is 83 years old, when in 1900 it was just 46. Advancements in medicine and our understanding of human health has, of course, significantly extended people's lifespans. Currently, the oldest confirmed person to have ever lived is one Jeanne Camant, who lived to be 122 years and 164 days old, passing away in 1997. 
Whilst 122 is incredibly impressive, today we are going to look at the man who claimed to live to 137. Chief John Smith was an Ojibwe man who lived in Minnesota before he eventually passed in 1922 of pneumonia. Before he lost his life, Chief John Smith earned quite a title for himself. He was recognized by local photographers who used him as a model in several stylized pictures that were intended to demonstrate aspects of Ojibwe life. These images were often then sold as cabinet cards and postcards. Smith had lived in Cass Lake his whole life, was familiar with the locals and was known by white people as the Old Indian. Whilst other Chippewa people referred to him as Gabina Goon once, translating to something along the lines of wrinkled meat, a delightful nickname. His family consisted of his eight wives and an adopted son by the name of Tom Smith. While John Smith's distinct aged appearance made him very well known during his lifetime, that doesn't mean that everyone took his alleged age at face value. There is a good deal of controversy surrounding the age at which John Smith lost his life. He claimed he was 137, as did other Chippewa people, and supposed witness accounts, though records seem to suggest that he was just 88 at the time of his passing. The Federal Commissioner of Indian Enrollment, Ransom J. Powell, said it was disease and not age that made him look the way he did. Paul Buffalo, a man who had lived with the Chippewa people when he was young and referred to Chief John Smith as Grandpa, has commented that he heard Smith tell stories of being between 8 and 10 when the stars fell. This is generally understood to refer to the Leonid meteor shower which took place in 1883, making Smith's birth year between 1823 and 1825, not the 1784 he claimed. The newspaper Star Tribune reported his passing, and here they highlighted Smith remembering Chippewa battles that took place before the 19th century, that he proudly recounted tales of fighting in the conflict of 1812, and his gravestone reads, born in 1784. We don't exactly know much about the life of the 137-year-old man, and finding his true age still sparks controversy 100 years later. Mysterious Ghost Hand in Historic Photo of Linen Mill Workers It's easy to find traces of a ghostly presence in some historic photos, with their grainy quality and blurred lines, but these anomalies can be easily explained by the imperfections of the film itself. However, sometimes there is photographic evidence that is much harder to dispute. One such example is a photo from 1900 of 15 young women who were workers at a linen mill in Northern Ireland arranged in rows with their arms crossed over their chests. All of the girls have their hands tucked underneath their arms, but one girl has a claw-like disembodied hand wrapped around her neck, resting on her shoulder. The hand appears to be coming from someone standing next to her, with an arm thrown around her as if around a friend. However, the truly ghostly part is that the girl is positioned at the end of a row, with nobody next to her. The hand is very clearly defined, and upon zooming in, even has sharp details such as shadowing and fingernails. The only girl behind her has her arms tightly crossed, and there is no explanation for where the hand could possibly be coming from. The girl and her companions appear to be entirely unfazed by the presence of a disembodied hand and seem to be entirely unaware of the spectral visitor in their photograph. One of the strangest elements of the photo is that the shape is clearly and undoubtedly a hand, but the lack of a ghostly body attached to the hand cannot give any clues as to the identity of the supernatural photobomber. Skeptics claim that the almost too perfect form of the hand is the result of a skilled Photoshop job or an optical illusion. While it seems unlikely that such a distinct image could be the chance result of light hitting the camera at an odd angle, the Photoshop explanation is more probable, as the photo surfaced after being submitted to a website by a woman whose grandmother was pictured and who claimed that the photo was a family ghost picture. The woman who submitted the picture stated, I don't really believe in ghosts, but there have been a few odd goings-on around this photo, so I hope this does not cause any more. However, she did not clarify what exactly the odd goings-on could be, and some speculate 
that the whole thing could be a clever hoax. So, is the photo a trick, or was there truly a ghostly presence lurking around these mill workers that day the photo was taken? We will likely never know and can only wonder at its strangeness. The Ape Man of the Amazon In 2012, a series of photographs circulated throughout the internet and became an instant viral mystery. These photos showcased an ape man that was discovered in the Brazilian jungle. In the 1930s, a Dutch magazine featured these pictures and described the man as the missing link. It gained a little attention when it was published in 1937, but reached the entire world when it resurfaced in 2012. Millions of people saw the pictures on Facebook, Twitter and Reddit and began coming up with their own theories and speculations. Online users were intent on figuring out the mystery and proving it to be a hoax. Some were eager to believe it to be true, while others argued it was merely prosthetics and makeup that changed the man's face. The man in question was bent over as if he were walking like a monkey and had ape-like lips and a deep-set brow. His nose and ears were larger than most people, and in every photo he held his hands in fists, closing the knuckles. Scientists, historians and online observers were quick to critique the pictures and point out obvious flaws in the hoax. Although the magazine claimed the man was a wild creature caught in the Amazonian jungle and was closely related to apes, he was surprisingly hairless. His face was clean-shaven and his hair neatly cut. Many also noted how poorly the prosthetics and makeup were applied to his face. You can see a fake line from the nose to the chin that connects the pieces and holds them in place. Critics claimed that his hair lay over his forehead to cover the prosthetics and blend in the makeup. Some claim that the most likely explanation for these photos is that the man was born with congenital disabilities and made to wear the prosthetics. Individuals born with defects were treated as outcasts and freaks during this period, so whoever planned these pictures probably exploited him to pretend to be an ape man. While most dismissed this picture as a fake, many people believe in ape-like creatures that you can only find in remote and hidden areas. Sasquatch in North America and the Yeti in the Himalayas have garnered attention and followers for decades, prompting many to explore the wilderness, searching for them. There is even a mythic ape-like beast that supposedly lives in the remote woods of Australia. The aboriginals call it the Yowie and claim it reaches five feet in height. There will always be hope for finding the missing link in human evolution, and since there are so many areas of the world still unexplored, there will always be people searching for it. So, what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comments section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.